I'll go ahead and start. So we're yeah. in Oakville. Um, we're at 800 Westgate Road, uh, uh, right across from Porsche, if you know where Porsche is. Uh, we've been here for about four years. But our company actually originally started as a machinery company, printing machinery company, and we actually started in Oakville in 1967. My dad rented some space on, I think it was 250 Spears Road. Then we moved to Sovereign and Nelson Streets in Bronte. The building is still there. It's now, a, it's now an apartment building of some sort. Uh, we also were on third line, I think, uh, 599 third line building still there, right at the southeast corner of Bronte and Spears. So our history in Oakville actually goes back a long, long way. Uh, we moved, uh, our business moved from Oakville to Mississauga. We spent most of our business lives in Mississauga, but we wanted to return back to Oakville. And as it so happened, we found the, what we thought was the perfect building. And uh, we, Leanna and I uh, renovated the building. It took us over a year. And we've turned it into a nonprofit museum about printing history. Uh, so we've got a variety of uh, different things in our museum, uh, museum, and I'm gonna show you some of them. I'll show you as much as I can. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Our, our, our basic focus with this museum is to restore very old printing machines, but we've also done some recently that are not very old, uh, maybe in the 50s, that type of thing, 1950s. Um, we try to touch every facet of the printing trade. There's almost everyone I've ever met knows someone who had a father, grandfather, uncle, great uncle, that was a printer or a typographer or a typesetter or a bookbinder. In my case, my father was a printer. Uh, he uh, was born in London, England, and uh, he came here in 1947 after the war. He served in the British Army, and he was a printer by trade. His father was a bookbinder. Uh, so we have quite a history of uh, printing in, in our in our family. The museum also has a lot of machines that you won't see if you went to a atypical museum, let's say in the United States. There's quite a few good museums in the US, but they tend to, to focus on typography and they tend to have machines that were made within the country that they, they are located. Our museum, because Leanna and I did uh, our business of uh, buying and selling printing equipment all over the world, I think we sold over to over 74 countries, is a much more international museum. So we went out of our way to collect machines that you normally wouldn't find in North America. And it makes it kind of interesting. We've also got a lot of things that have nothing to do with printing, tools, wrenches, things like that, that a lot of people find fascinating when they come and visit the museum. So I'm going to try and figure out how I can turn this picture around. Uh, my daughter told me that, but uh, uh, oh, here it is. Oops. There we go. OK. So this is the start of the tour. So I'll take you to a few things that kind of stand out that uh, maybe the people tuning in today might have an interest in. We've got some interesting artifacts that are rather rare. This isn't particularly old, but most of you can recognize what that is. I don't know if you're getting too much of the light there. This is the 1969 lockup, what we call a lockup of the New York Times. Uh, the original master lockup, which is this piece here that I'm looking at. This is all lead, uh, zinc plates here. And uh, this is a uh, facsimile of that page. This is all wrong reading. In the old days with, with, uh, with letterpress and newspapers, 
uh, you had to make a, what we call a stereo. A stereo was really uh, made from a mold of the original type, this type here. So this is wrong reading. The stereo, the, the mold would be pressed into it and we'd become what we call right reading. And then lead would be poured into that to create a stereo. This is the absolute master that was at the New York Times. So when they had to lock this up, they had to what they had to ink it up and proof it, make sure there was no mistakes and grammar and spelling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and once they've determined that, they would they would make a mold of it. And they would make many shells or stereos, which would then go up to the printing press. So we're lucky to have this. Uh, 1969, as you can tell, the New York Times was still using lead. Lead's been around with printing since 1450 when Gutenberg made his first movable type. Um, we've also got up there the old sign from the Globe and Mail uh, when they're on Front Street. Uh, if anyone's... Uh, can remember far enough back, they probably remember the Toronto Telegram. And that used to be the Telegram building. So this is a piece of history, printing history, and we're, we're really lucky to get it. We've also got a series of what we call hand iron presses, and some of them are rather unique. Uh, the machines that you're looking at right now, the red one is, a, is what we call an Albion machine. It's made in England. Uh, very popular. Uh, they're still being used for printing by artisans and artists and whatnot all over the world, especially in, in Britain. Uh, we've got some interesting ones. This machine was invented by a guy by the name of Cope, and it was really quite successful. It was invented in, in uh, 1820. Uh, Cope died, uh, as we all do, and uh, these two scoundrels bought the business and their names were Jonathan and Jeremiah Barrett. So what the first thing they did is they slapped their name all over the coat machine. So that's what makes this particular one fairly rare. And when I say they slapped their name on it, they've got their name everywhere on this machine. Uh, they used to put the co coat of arms on it. This machine is made in 1831. So I think it was about the year that Cope died. Uh, we've got another great popular machine called the, Al uh, called the Columbian. We've got lots of Columbians. So we've put some different Columbians here. The Columbian machine uh, was made by a guy by the name of George Clymer. He was American. And he came from Philadelphia, but he didn't have a lot of luck making these in, in the US. And he moved to London, England in 1813 and started manufacturing them. They became really popular in Britain, even though they had all this Americana all over at the Eagle and lots of, lots of ornateness about that. But the, the British really took to this machine and it was also the first iron press before there were wood presses that didn't use a wine screw to actually bring down the the plot and when i say a wine screw this was using levers and it, what we call a great bar that that big heavy piece up there is a great bar and that's really all this machine does and they were used to print newspapers and uh, every type of form of letterpress printing. We've got uh, one that's painted uh, pink. And because we have so many, we have a lot in storage still. This one is from, I think, 1874. It was made by a, a company called Figgins on Ray Street in London. And uh, we decided to paint this one pink uh, to help support uh, research in breast cancer. And we're hoping that one day maybe we can donate this one to the new hospital in Oakville. We haven't been able to do that yet because we just finished this bef just before uh, COVID arrived and everything kind of slowed down. This is a Washington press. 
course, the Americans were also making machines and uh, the Washington press was named because they stuck a bas relief figure of George Washington on the top of it. It became a very popular machine. It was actually invented by a fellow by the name of Robert Ho in New York. Ho came from England in the early 1800s. He built up what was what became one of the largest manufacturers of printing equipment in the world. Uh, this is a small machine that Ho made. Ho got, uh, uh, got much more involved in newspaper printing uh, and started selling very large newspaper presses. And then you get into more automated machines that we've restored. A lot of these took a lot of work to do. This is a very kind of a very uh, interesting machine that very rare. It's made by Harris. Uh, today, Harris is a uh, $13 billion company. It's L3 Harris, but it was started by two brothers in Ohio. This machine is built in 19, or 1899, and uh, it was missing a lot of parts. So we spent a lot of time at the Smithsonian American History Museum where the records for Harris are still kept. And we actually manufactured a lot of the parts ourselves. And we've got this machine actually printing. We actually printed a job on this, this machine. So we're really thrilled about this. What's so interesting about this is the hand machines that I showed you over here with the lever and the bed that slides out that you've probably seen videos running. You were lucky on a good day with a helper to maybe get 800 copies an hour. Uh, these platen presses came next. We call them platens because the, uh, there's a lot of movable parts. These uh, were a little, quite a bit faster and depending on, uh, boys used to run these. And as fast as they could feed and deliver these machines, they could probably get up to over a thousand an hour. The Harris brothers, built this machine, but they also built a really clever feeder, automatic feeder, never seen before. It's a shuttle feeder. The technology within the shuttle feeder is still used all over the printing industry today, especially for direct mail imprinting and stuff like that. This machine could run 18,000 an hour back in 1896. And the reason that a lot of people don't really remember this is because Few people have believed that uh, a machine like this existed or could run and work. They designed this mainly to print on tags and print on envelopes. The machine next to it's kind of interesting. It, if you notice, it has a pistol um, mounted on top. That wouldn't have come with the machine. The reason we have that is that is made uh, that is made by the Colts Firearm Company in Connecticut. The gun and the printing press. The printing press, the Colts built a lot of their own machinery to make their guns. They were very good at it. And they became a contract manufacturer for uh, an inventor in New York, a guy by the name of Golly, to make these machines for Golly, they eventually took over the rights to this machine and uh, they call it the Colts Armory. It's quite a, quite a good machine. And the design of this machine is so good that a version of this machine still being made in countries like Italy, China, uh, Spain, but they're main, made to die cut and they can go up to 120 inches. This is a very small machine, a 10 by 15. This is uh, another popular machine that exists from the late 1800s. This is a, a Golding. We have several versions of the Golding. We've just finished this little tiny machine. This is, uh, this is actually a, a cute little toy. It's made by uh, two, part, two brothers in uh, New York. New York City called uh, Dunning, and it's a pencil printing machine. 
So <laughs> you basically can print and we've got it set up and we actually printed some of our own, own pencils on this thing. And basically the pencil, the pencil sits up here and the type sits under here, it's inked up, there's ink on the platen. And as this rolls over, it rolls over the pencil and prints the pencil. So there's something that uh, most people have never seen before. We've also got a gallery and that may interest some people. And this is where we keep our type. And we keep, uh, bit of brick and brack of everything here, anything to do with print. Yeah, you know, we, we were lucky to get a lot of things from uh, the, the uh, to Toronto Trade Union uh, that uh, they didn't need anymore. And uh, some of these are just wonderful classic uh, uh, things that the union themselves had and their history. My dad wasn't much of a union, he wasn't a union guy at all, but I'm sure he still would have appreciated this. So these are what we call tight cabinets. And these drawers are all marked with type. And this is a, that's not, that's not a California case. Let's find a California case. There's a California case. That what they call uh, the cases, these are called cases, not drawers. And these cases uh, have a spe specific layout for type. And that expression that you might have heard, out of sorts, that's an old printing expression, means you're out of type. Um, you need a lot of different materials for, for locking up your form or your chase um, and things like leads and spacers and whatnot. We try to keep uh, different uh, languages here. We were lucky we picked up some Hebrew type, lead type. Um, we've got some early photo composition of old Apple II, the Macintosh. A lot of you will remember those. Before that, it was still impact typing for, this is a Veritiper. This, this is a big, comp uh, big company in, in uh, print where somebody usually a secretary would type the copy directly onto using a special ribbon onto a piece of paper. And then they would take a picture of that in a large graphic arts camera. We uh, also have just finished these. Uh, these are uh, 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 measuring units that will measure the height of a block. In our case, in Canada, as in England and the US, the standard type height is 0.918 of an inch. So when you made uh, or mounted onto a piece of wood, a cut, you had to make sure that the cuts were all the same height and you used a machine like this. This is a British one and these two are American. And we also have a few of the old Gestetner uh, mimeograph machines uh, that uh, we have on display in an Ed Edison mimeograph machine. We've kept a lot of uh, different things in our display cabinets because some people that have been in the printing industry, they're going to be a little bit more interested in things like grippers and pads and things like that than others that haven't been to our to mu museum. So if somebody wants to come in and look at all our type, all these drawers are full of type and they're all marked. And as you can see, uh, we try to keep all our type in, in, in good condition. We've also uh, keep samples of print, uh, some of it old like old letterheads, uh, things uh, that are from a bygone era, a uh, lot of Canadiana. This, for example, is a photo, and we think it was taken at Queen's Park in Toronto in 1921. And it says old 91 ITU, that's the International Typographical Union, Labor Day. 
uh, Labor Day actually exists uh, greatly in part to the uh, our local Toronto uh, trade unit union, and they're celebrating here a 44-hour week celebrating. They were still working Saturdays. <laughs> we have we have another old photo here from 1883, and I've tracked this this monument down. It's near. It's really in Queen's Park. Um, it's still there. And the, that's our oldest photo. Then things like this. This is again, Canadiana. This was a, uh, uh, a large printer at the time, Toronto Lithographing. And that was their, their uh, print uh, menu card for what they were gonna do at their, uh, their August 1894. Uh, summer party. And we have some other pictures. These are all union related. This happens to be uh, 1930 and it's in Toronto because uh, Toronto was a, always a big center for printing. Uh, this is uh, Wabasso Park from 19... What year was this? I think this was 1924. And Wasso Park was changed, the name was changed in 1926 to, uh, what's the name of the park, Leanna? I can't hear you, you're muted. Here you go, LaSalle. LaSalle Park. LaSalle in Park in Burlington, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we've also got uh, samples of uh, intaglio. Intaglio was used um, mainly for uh, bearer bonds, uh, money. So we've got different uh, different uh, types of money, old money. We've got um, some old Bank of England fivers. Um, and we have one that was printed by a German prisoners of war during World War II, they were all Jews that were forced to print these fivers. It was called Operation Bernard and they only came to light when they floated up from a lake in, in uh, Austria. So we have a real fiver and then we have one of the Operation Bernard fivers. And of course, stock certificates, you can't, uh, you can't have a museum without a few stock certificates, especially when they have to do with printing. And on this side over here, we, we tried to departmentalize a little bit so people can get a kind of a gist of where they're at. This is, uh, shows some uh, typesetting machine, hot metal machines. This is a linotype that we're looking at here. It's not very old, it's 1954. We have another older linotype that was built, I think in 1925. We also have this old, uh, intertype, which was a competitor to linotype. These machines really changed our industry drastically because before these machines were around with a keyboard, every printer had to set type by hand, one letter at a time, and put it back. With these machines, you, you uh, were able to type as fast as you could type. The molds would fall down from the top when the molds came down, they would form a line and uh, whatever you had just typed, you would get a slug coming out from here. And then these molds would automatically go back up the machine, fall back and tinkle down into the, what we call a magazine. And if you wanted to change the type, the style or the, the size of your type, uh, you would change your magazine and the richer a printer became, the more selection he would have. And you were using lead from pigs. There's a pig, you can see it's already, it's been in the pot. There's the pot down there and the pot takes about an hour to heat up. And it was just a very complicated machine. It was made, invented by Ottmar Mergenthaler, who is a German who immigrated to America. And he invented these in Baltimore. And it became the Mergenthaler Linotype Company and it basically changed, changed the world. This Intertype, uh, Intertype was a company that started also 
uh, in New York, New York City. What's interesting about this one is when I was a little kid on Spears Road, uh, there was a fellow uh, by the name of John Holsey. He's passed away now, but he was old when I was a kid. And he rented some space from my dad. And he had this machine. And I remember him, he used to make rubber stamps. And in order to do that, you had to uh, type the, uh, the copy um, with uh, and get a slug. And then you would form it through rubber. And uh, that's how rubber stamps were made. And I remember he made me a rubber stamp with this, with this cast off of this machine. So when he passed away, his daughter called me and uh, we just had to save it. Otherwise it would have gone to scrap. Uh, this is a, a Japanese type caster. Uh, it's not terribly old. I think it's uh, 70, 1971. We got this in Vancouver. It's a very rare machine today. Uh, and we have all sorts of Chinese uh, mats for this. And you can actually see if you look very carefully in here, I don't know if you can see it. You can see the type. So in this case with the Chinese or the Japanese mats, you only have one mold. This machine would be running and the type would be forming and coming out here. And if you're too late to catch it, it would fall and go down into a bucket down here. But normally you'd put it up here. Um, we have some paper cutters, uh, guillotines as they call them in Europe. Um, some very old uh, paper cutters. This is a very old uh, German paper cutter from 1877. We got this one in Belgium. The reason we, we got this one is because the manufacturer is a fellow by the name of Andreas Hom, and he is in Frankenthal. But shortly after that, he moved to Heidelberg. And today, that company is the largest printing press manufacturer in the world called Heidelberg. And so that's why we have this. And we have some early book binding machines for wire stitching and wire sewing. This is a very rare Connus B made in London paper cutter or guillotine, very rare. This is an old uh, Barry paper drill. There was a lot of uh, three hole drilling and five hole drilling back in the day. Very dangerous machine today, very noisy. This is where we got our name from, even though our Leanne, Leanne and my name, last name is Howard, Howard Ironworks. They are, were a company in Buffalo they actually made paper cutters. They made a lot of things. They made a vice, they made vices, they made fire hydrants, they made nut and bolt making machines. They were taken over by a company called JD Cousins. And that company, JD Cousins exists today. Uh, they don't have anything to do with printing, uh, but we were able to uh, get them to agree to let us use that Howard Ironworks name. And that's why that's, called what it is. We have a lot of little bits and pieces. These, these are kind of an interesting little machine. This is called a, a wing mailer. And these were very popular with schools, uh, with uh, newspapers and school kids would uh, be going to newspapers, uh, small local newspapers after, uh, after school for, for extra money. And they would be handed one of those and you were able to, at each cut, they would be able to advance the label. There would be an address printed on that. And there would be a pot of water in this brass here and it would be gummed paper. And that's how they used to put the addresses on by hand. Up here, we've got a few more platen presses. Uh, they're kind of unique. This is a uh, Arab, the blue machine there. It's made in Halifax in England. Still, still rather uh, popular in the UK and in Australia. It was said that the machine was called an Arab because the inventor, Joshua Wade, felt that the Arabs were hard workers. 
So everyone still calls it an error. And then what we have here is some proof presses. Of course, when you were printing, you had to, and you're setting type and locking cuts and whatnot, everything was backwards and you really couldn't see if everything was right, uh, if the type was damaged or if the spelling was correct or the spacing were, was right. So machines like these uh, proof presses and much cruder ones for smaller print shops were made so that the, the uh, printer could put their work or their chase into the bed and uh, ink it up and do what we call a proof. Here's a, kind of an example here of, uh, of a job that we ran. Uh, it happens to be the front page of the, the Toronto Star from, from uh, 1983. So we printed that. So that's what would happen at even places like the Toronto Star. Once they've got the plate made, they had to go send it to the uh, proofreader. That was a pretty important job at newspapers and magazines and publications. Somebody have to go through the whole thing and find all the mistakes before it made to press. The amazing thing is Today, there are so many typos and spelling mistakes in almost everything. When you're looking at anything online, you think it's so easy for them to correct the mistakes. There was very few mistakes like that in the old uh, printing days. This is a uh, Mercedes. This is another rather unusual machine. It's made in Holland. The design of this machine is uh, kind of unique. You've got sucker bars flying all over the place when this thing's running. It's really fun to watch. Um, it was originally manufactured by um, uh, a guy by the name of Paul Glockner in Leipzig. It was also made in Britain, a version of this. Um, it was, it was, there was a version made in South, in, in Brazil, um, probably missing a few. They made them in East Germany after the wall went up. This is uh, from 1954. It was actually made in Amsterdam. And we've uh, printed on this machine and uh, we printed up a little brochure to, to tell folks all about this, this particular machine, what it was, what it did. And you don't see these in North America. This is uh, also another machine that we're just getting ready to print on. We've got this one in, uh, in Ber um, Hamburg. And it's called a uh, Schnelllaufer, which is fast press, exquisite. This was made in 1920. So it's already had its 100th, uh, 100th birthday. And uh, we've restored it. It didn't look like this when we got it. And it uh, is also made by the company Heidelberg. This is even before it was called Heidelberg. Uh, Heidelberg is probably best known for this machine, which is the Heidelberg windmill or the T platen, or if you're European, you might call it the Teagle. Uh, a lot of people call it different things. They called it the windmill because these grippers, this is called a gripper here. When this platen is moving, this, these grippers are running around like a helicopter. It's an incredibly simple system and they got the name windmill and it kind of stuck. Heidelberg made a lot of these machines from about 1920 up until 1985. We were very fortunate that we found probably the last two. These came from Belgium and they were manufactured in 1985 and they're actually brother and sister. We have another one up, up front. Back here, we have uh, an offset press. Offset's a different kind of technology and it's still used today. Um, it was invented basically, or not invented, it was kind of rediscovered in 1904. This particular machine is made by Heidelberg. It's hard to not have a museum without having a lot of Heidelberg equipment. It was called the Rotospeed. It was never really a good machine. Uh, today, of course, Heidelberg makes legendary offset process. 
but we wanted to have, to have one of these to show people what the early Heidelbergs look like. It's a 28 by 40 two color press. And we also st stuck a large feeder, because of course you have to have a feeder to feed the paper and it's called a suction feeder. This was made by Spies. Today's Heidelberg feeder looks like that. Much bigger, really heavy, amazing feeder. That feeder there will run at 18,000 an hour. This feeder down here, you're lucky to run at seven. And we have just finished this machine. This is also a very rare machine. It's the only one that we really saw ever. It's uh, Heidelberg SRDW, and we got this in Berlin. It was a, uh, it is a rotary two-color letter press, and it perfects. That means it prints on both sides of the paper at the same time. And the big reason they Heidelberg spent all this money on this machine was pocketbooks were getting really, really popular. And if you wanted to run multiple uh, forms of black, black ink, um, and let's say you were running uh, 24, 48 page pocket books, you could finish the, the whole flat, what we call that sheet in one shot, it would be printed and done and then go off to the bindery to be folded and added to the next signature. Uh, Heidelberg only made a hundred and something of these. Uh, so we're very really happy to get this machine and we want to get it printing uh, so people can see how it works and you won't see you won't see another one of those this is a smaller two color rotary machine when i say rotary it's because we went from a flatbed where the flatbed was going back and forth to rotary which of course is a allows the machine to run a lot faster it was a two color and there's the printing plate there of one unit the other so you could actually print two colors at the same time no one really uses this, this, this types of technology anymore uh, but some machines like the flatbed we was talking about earlier being a heidelberg again this is one that we restored it's a heidelberg ksd the bed goes back and forth you can see the bed here uh, they're also used for die cutting and scoring and perforating and uh there are probably over a thousand of these running in Canada uh, or ver uh, this version somewhere running in Canada. This is one of our oldest uh, presses. It was called a country press. Um, it was really designed to be sold to newspapers, to small town newspapers like Oakville would have been at one time where the proprietor was the guy collecting all the news. And then on uh, the end of the week, he would lock up his form and he would print uh, print his paper and he'd have some some kids come in and fold the paper in half and distribute it this machine uh, was made no later than 1865 we know that for sure because of the maker and when we got the machine it was all dismantled and we had to make a lot of parts for this we actually got this machine printing it's a pretty simple looking machine but back in the day this was actually made in Rhode Island even though it the, the nameplate says it was made in, in, in New York. It wasn't. Um, it was a very typical machine, and uh, it uh, would use a, what we call a mangle drive, which drove the bed back and forth. Uh, and that mangle drive was used on the first machine that Koenig uh, designed to print the Times of London. Um, so it goes back a long way, that, that motion. This is another very popular machine that you won't see in Canada. I don't, you won't see it in the US either. You'll see it in Australia, New Zealand. You'll see it in England. You'll see it in parts of Europe. It's called a Wharfdale, named after the river Wharf in Otley. And it was a very popular machine in the UK right up until the early 1970s. This is a really old one, but they came in all sorts of sizes. The thing is, a lot of manufacturers made these, and they all called them the Wharfdale, but they were made by different companies. Dawson, Payne, and Elliott. This one was made by Dawson and his son. Uh, there's got to be at least 15 or 20 manufacturers of these. My dad 
learned his apprenticeship in London on a machine like this on a wharf tail. It was a hand fed, which means that the kid, the, the boy would have to feed the paper with here and you have to feed and feed by hand and you have to do it in time with this cylinder. And then uh, this neat system, when this came out, the Dawson uh, patent flyer came out, that allowed the sheet to be delivered onto this board. And that was a major uh, milestone for printers. We got this machine in Cheddar in England and we got it from the printer that, was, uh, that had used it. He took it all apart and left it in the shed. And uh, I was lucky, we were lucky to, to get this machine. So we had it shipped over here. And uh, it's a nice piece of history. This is another hugely popular machine that we got in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a Heidelberg, but it's from 1949. This machine actually started, this model came out in 1935, but the war was beginning and very few were sold until 1949. So we're very fortunate that we got this 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 machine. Then you get into stone or lithostone or lithography, as it became known. This is a lithostone. It's a Canadian lithostone. It's got a multicolored job laid out on this stone. Stockings, silk stockings. Here, this is a pretty big stone, and this stone would fit a machine like this big hoe. So we call this metal decorating. Anytime you print on steel, or they used to call it, uh, they used to refer to it as tin printing, but it was never tin, it was steel, to print on containers, cookie jars, uh, soda. You can see some of the samples of things here that you, I'm sure you all remember. Anytime you had a three-piece can, like a soda, a pop can, a, a three-piece can, all the flats, were printed the beer cans. You remember the beer cans were flat. They were all printed on a more modern version of this machine. This came out of Manhattan and we restored it. It's really also a very rare machine because most of the old metal decorating machines like this were all scrapped. There's an example of a metal decorating sheet. And this sheet was printed at Crown Court and Seal in Toronto where they still do some flat sheet metal decorating, but I certainly don't run on a machine like this. And there's another example of a, of a litho stone. This happens to be for an old Toronto uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, looks like label, Shuttlesworth Chemical Company, it says here. And the stone would have actually been inlaid in here instead of this hunk of cast which was put in after so that a modern offset plate could go there they would actually take the stone and put it in there so you can imagine if it was a four or five or six color job and the stone was like that big stone there and two guys and an elephant are trying to put that in this printing press and they break it which happened a lot you'd have to start all over again this is a very old uh machine we also got this one in Amsterdam this is a Klein Forst and Bone manufacturer they actually came from the company MAN M-A-N Machine and Fabric Augsburg Nuremberg still a very big company today you might know somebody might have heard of the MAN trucks they're into all sorts of things diesel engines and stuff like that but they originally started out making printing machines and this is a very interesting machine because it used a planetary gear instead of the mangle drive that I was talking about earlier to allow this bed to go back and forth. And you can see there's a lockup of uh, lead, lead type here. And then somebody would be turning that hand wheel. So you can imagine that's a lot of work. And of course with printing, you get uh, the needed extras. You had to have densitometers. These are some pretty old densitometers. This is a really old Kodak densitometer. This one's for film. This one's also for film. It's called a transmission. And then you got into the reflection type densitometer, which is these ones here. And they would come with a little charger. This was a very expensive uh, 
densitometer made by Graytag. And I remember when I started uh, in the trade, these were a very expensive commodity to have. This is uh, a baking unit. Now it's not very interesting on its own, but what's really interesting about this is it was made by the Halloid Company, which of course you can see the name Xerox. This is before they made the Xerox plate make uh, Xerox uh, machine before they got Chester Carlson's patents to start making the machine which became xerography so there's quite a little bit of history to the to this because halloid before the xerox was big big in uh supplying film and uh pmt paper and things like that for the printing trade this is an ink mixer which probably looks like your your uh, kitchen uh baking appliance but in the old days again Printers would have to mix their own inks. They'd have to add uh, uh, different uh, additives to make the pink, uh, the ink set faster um, or to dry a little bit slower, depending on what it was. Uh, if they were mixing a special color, printers used to have to do that by hand. Today, uh, in a normal large print shop, that doesn't happen. The, the inks are all pre-mixed. Uh, the pressmen don't do that anymore. Now, have I missed anything? This thing up here, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is a German light source. So as the printing industry got into making, uh, to using film uh, to make their plates, they had to burn the image and this has two big carbon sticks in it. And they would, uh, uh, the aluminum bars that you see on the side there, there were solenoids and they would bring these two arc uh, lights together to create this really bright light. And this thing, when it was installed properly had pulleys on it. So as the, the sticks were, the arc sticks were down, the operator would lower this to the ground so we could get at it and change the sticks. And it would create a lot of smoke. We've just made this little display up here of different, what we call feeder heads. And there's some interesting feeder heads. And that was an important part of the printing industry too. So what we tried to do here is we tried to restore these instead of just having an old mucky looking uh, unit feeder head. We thought, well, it would be a great idea if we could restore them so people could see what they probably looked like when they were when they were new. This particular one is made by uh, Dexter for Mealy. And this is a very old head, 1927. And you can see the suction cup at the bottom there. I don't know if you can see that or not. And there's different manufacturers. These are German. This is an old uh, Swedish uh, Ellis uh, feeder head from just after the war. Of course, there's different tools that were needed for uh, printing, and we made display boards up for those, so people could see. We have rules. Uh, you always saw a typographer with a with a rule. Uh, you'd have sticks. This stick is for wood type because it's really big. It would be for doing like a header if you were in a newspaper business. You know, the screaming header at the top. These are smaller sticks. These are what the, the compositor would use to hold in his hand while he collected the type out of the tray and he would fill up uh, fill whatever the length of the line was, he would set this and there's a scale on it. And we have different examples of these. We have German, we have English and a lot, the, a lot of American ones. Of course, counters were kind of new to the industry and they were used in a lot of different kinds of machines but we tried to save as many as we could that had to do with the printing trade. A lot of these companies are still around like Durant, uh, Vita Root down here, well known as a manufacturer of counters and then different kinds of wrenches. The old uh, presses, depending on what they were, they didn't, they didn't always use a standard uh, size. Uh, the British of course use Whitworth so we have lots of uh, these Whitworth 
wrenches here. Of course, you can still find Whitworth wrenches, but a lot of these ones are pretty old. We've got quite a few old, old tools that uh, are quite interesting. This side here, we've got some old tools used by Heidelberg. The interesting thing about the Germans was until the very early 1930s or mid 30s, even, let's say the mid 30s, all of the machines they manufactured were in Whitworth threads and Whitworth sizes. So to compensate as they tried to, even though metric existed, the Germans would create these odd wrenches sizes. So there's several here that don't make any sense. In fact, this Hogan Force, which is a German wrench, it, it's Mark 7 16. So that's in the Whitworth size. 18 millimeter is not a standard uh, metric size. So that would have fit a Whitworth size. And then Mealy, which was a very big company in Chicago, they would, they didn't make this wrench, but they, they had this meant wrench stamped with their name on it. And uh, we tried to keep as many of those as we possibly could. Uh, some manufacturers made special wrenches. Harris did that. They were a little bit special. This, this particular wrench here with the wiggle was uh, really hard to get wrench. It always disappeared. It was for the Harris offset presses to set the uh, ink rollers. Uh, these are old traditional screwdrivers from Germany. These are from Bremer. Uh, we also have two uh, wrenches here. This is a uh, Czech, Czechoslovakian wrench. Uh, this is made in the DDR. These two, these three wrenches here are made in the Soviet Union. Um, this is another East German wrench here. So a lot of people can come and see and uh, even if they're not interested in printing, they, they might be interested in things like that. We've got different devices that people can look at and we can explain why they're here and how significant they, they were. And of course, you got to have some control, uh, control knobs and uh, speedometers and whatnot. And a lot of the printing machines, they would make their own, uh, buy the gauges, but make their own uh, housings for them. So we included that. This, this happens to be a uh, Thompson platen made in Manchester. We took some license and decided to put a Union Jack on it. This was a machine that was to compete against that Heidelberg windmill that I showed you earlier. Um, it's a different kind of machine. There's a couple of these in Canada. There's quite a few in the UK. Uh, they're really heavy compared to the Heidelberg and they're not as easy to use. Although anyone in England would probably argue with you. This is a Victoria. This is made in East Germany, in, uh, in Leipzig before the wall. We just finished restoring this one. It has a feeder, which makes it really kind of unique. And uh, it's a very good machine. And it's a bit of a copy of that Colts Armory that, that I showed you earlier, but it had an automatic feeder. Um, so if the feeder, if the feeder was working well, it, uh, it allowed the operator to stand back and not have to do all the work himself. As far as safety, there wasn't really any safety. When this, when this unit comes back, it swings back in a hurry. So of course, there's your safety guard to stop it from hit, hitting you in the face. That's, that's it. There is no other safeties to the machine. One of the most popular American machines that was made for the small job shops was the Mealy vertical. They called it a vertical because of course the bed's going up and down on this one, not flat back and forth like uh, the other ones I showed you. This is one of the last ones that Mealy made. They made them since 1920. And this one's about 1974, what we call the V50X. And it was used for all sorts of things, including a lot of numbering checks. Davis and Henderson was, is a big company in Toronto, even to this day. They built their business on Mealy's. This is a, an older Mealy. This is to give 
folks an idea of what the, the early Mealy looked like. And this is about 1926. And we restored the machine. And uh, they're, they're quite a good machine. They're a little bit more difficult to run than a Heidelberg. Uh, they have a bigger sheet size. Um, and uh, a lot of these are still running in the US and you can find these pretty well anywhere. A lot of them scrap, but a lot of the letterpress community in the US now and are, are t t taking advantage of these. They even made a copy of this in England called the Holmes Vertical. This is uh, here because this is made in uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, it's called a Grafo Press. They were never as good as the Heidelberg. They tried to cop the, copy the Heidelberg. This is an older one. This is from 1958. And uh, so we figured we need to have one of those here so people can see the difference between the two. They were never really a great machine. They had features the Heidelberg didn't have, and people usually bought them because they were cheaper than the Heidelberg. The, the reason we have the newer one over here is because we wanted to show people what the old, oldest one or one of the oldest ones looked like, and then one of the last ones looked like. This is one that we did back in the late 80s. It's a 1927 uh, Heidelberg Platten. And we printed on this machine. Uh, and it's just quite a little amazing machine. So this Heidelberg platen went from this, the way it looks now, pretty crude, to what it looked like when they stopped making it right here. You can see there's lots more, there's a lot more safety uh, devices built into this. And you still see a lot of these. There's a printer in Oakville that does a lot of greeting cards and custom letterpress work, um, Passion Letterpress. They're just around the corner from us. He has a battery of these in his shop. This is a little piccolo. That's the name of it. It's a typical German stop cylinder press. This was all hand crank. And this was a very small size as you may or may not be able to tell from what I'm showing you here, the bed is the very small, so you might get a you might get a 13 by 18 sheet in here. This one we got in, uh, I think, in Belgium, and we've restored it. It didn't look like this when we got it, so we wanted to, uh, we're going to print on this one, and it's a kind of a cute little machine. These stop cylinders didn't exist, it didn't sell in Canada or the U.S. This is another machine that you won't see very i've never seen i never saw one of these it's made by a company called pouts and pouts is located in uh, berlin they're long gone now but this was mainly made for the railway industry pouts made as we found out later they made a lot of special machines for the uh the bonhof in germany for different kinds of tickets this takes tickets from a roll as you can see there there's a blank roll feeds the tickets up it has a tinter, so it can actually put some color on the ticket if you wanted to run a stripe. It'll print on the tickets. These are uh, uh, printing units here. And there's another printing unit and there's a numbering unit here to create a number. It, it will perforate the ticket, little pinholes. Uh, you could slit it. If it was an extra wide ticket, which this one isn't, you could slit the ticket and run it down to two rewinders. And you can see what we've already printed on this. And we've used the Craftsman Club, which is the club for uh, uh, the printer's club, where they used to share their knowledge. That's the symbol for the Craftsman Club. And we've also, we also, uh, I can zoom in on here. We also numbered it. So it does a sequential numbering. And we've got this set up so when the museum opens again, we can run this machine and people can watch the tickets being printed. There's a counter up here. So if you were using this as a production machine today, you would be able to, if somebody needed their tickets in 200s or something like that, you, you could stop the machine. So I think I've pretty well covered everything here.
Uh, there's still a lot more to see, but I've tried to point out some of the more interesting things. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions for anyone, if anyone has any questions they want to ask.